As I said earlier, we are finishing up our series on the gospel according to Mr. Rogers um, this Sunday. And I have loved this series um, for many reasons. Um, But I think uh, one of those reasons is that um, it helps us see going into Mr. Rogers' neighborhood helps us see what living the gospel looks like um, in our own times. What does it mean to live out the gospel values of love and acceptance in our current climate, right? And Mr. Rogers is a really good model for us in that. Um, It helps us take um, these ancient scriptures that we traffic in every Sunday um, and put them in our own context um, and see what it means to live them out. And in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, we have looked at the gift of the neighborhood itself. We have looked at the gifts of silence and of love and diversity and protection. But today we're looking at the gift of imperfection, and that kind of sounds oxymoronic, does it not? Um, But Mr. Rogers also uh, meant for the neighborhood to be a place where we could have, as he called it, important talk, okay? Feelings um, that are, especially for children, very strong and can feel overpowering, anger or sadness or grief, all of those things could be brought into the neighborhood and discussed honestly. Um, And Mr. Rogers could offer understanding. And imperfection is one of those. So our culture, I think, as I was talking about with our kids up here, our culture has a thing about perfection, right? I would call it perfectionism. Think about the advertising that we are bombarded with of how we should look or how we should live or things we should have. It's really interesting to consider that our littles, ages two to five, are big targets of marketing. Hmm. And then consider our obsession with rankings and hierarchies and where we fit into those and trying to make ourselves just so we can fit, right? Trying to make ourselves right. But the thing is, the underside of this is shame because we so frequently fall short from that ideal that our culture places before us. And it is something that we struggle with. And I think that it is very important talk that we need to have. So let us let Daniel Stripe Tiger talk about this problem with us. You know something, Lady Evelyn? What, Daniel? I've been wondering about something myself. Something about Mr. Skunk? Something about mistakes. What is it? I've been wondering if I was a mistake. If you were a mistake? (laughs) What do you mean, Daniel? Well, for one thing, I've never seen a tiger that looks like me. No. And I've never heard a tiger that talks like me. No. And I don't know any other tiger who lives in a clock. No, neither do I. Or loves people. Oh, Daniel. Sometimes I wonder if I'm too tame. Sometimes I wonder if I'm a mistake. I'm not like any else I know when I'm asleep or even awake sometimes I get to dreaming 
that I'm just a fake. I'm not like anyone else. Others I know are big and are wild. I'm very small and quite tame. Most of the time, I'm weak and I'm mild. Do you suppose that's a shame? Often I wonder if I'm a mistake. I'm not supposed to be scared, am I? Sometimes I cry and sometimes I shake. Wondering, isn't it true that the strong never break? I'm not like anyone else I know. I'm not like anyone else. You ever feel that way? Like you're not like anybody else and that it's somehow a failure? This clip is readily accessible on YouTube. And if you pull it up and you scroll down and look at the comments that people have made over the years, the comments are heartbreaking. This is one of them. This song put into words a feeling I have had my whole life. This feeling of being a mistake, something that we carry within our own being, it's this sense of shame about not just things we do, but who we are. And Daniel Striped Tiger is also playing on this idea of what it means to be strong. The line in the song, wondering if it's true that the strong never break. One of Fred Rogers' favorite scriptures was the text we heard from 1 Corinthians. For God chose what is weak to shame the wise. It is like the words of the gospel just coming right out of the screen. In an interview with a journalist on Nightline, not long before Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood ceased production, Mr. Rogers shared a story about a letter that he had received from a young woman that had watched him when she was a little girl. She was horribly abused when she was little. And she would find solace in a small room of her house that had a small television and she would watch Mr. Rogers and in her letter she related to him that as she watched Mr. Rogers, that she came to understand that maybe she was special. That maybe she wasn't deserving of the treatment that she got. And she took that message into adulthood with her. And Mr. Rogers described the space between the television and that little girl those years ago as holy ground. He said, it's not anything that I brought about. It's not a space that I control, but that there is a force that is at work in that space, bringing a voice of assurance. Maybe that little girl heard a message something like this. Let's roll the second clip. Daniel was wondering if he was a mistake because he didn't look or sound like any other tiger that he knew. Well, all tigers are different, just like all people are different. 
and there is no person in this whole world who is a mistake, no matter how different that person may seem. Each person is fine. I like to imagine that little girl hearing that message, that she is fine, that she's not a mistake. Hmm. This pulls us, hearing those words and, and considering Daniel Striped Tiger's struggle, and I, Mr. Rogers did the voice of Daniel Striped Tiger, by the way. It pulls us from the realm of shame into the realm of grace. The grace that Jesus spent his life and gave his life for he spent his life preaching about it, proclaiming it, acting it out, and Mr. Rogers bore witness to that grace in the neighborhood of make-believe. It is an invitation that is offered to us over and over again that can pull us from that place where we feel ashamed of who we are or who we aren't, into a realm of love in which we can remember who we are, really who we are, and whose we are. There is a good salvation word, and that is justification. You know, when we accept the grace of Jesus Christ into our own lives, we are justified. When I was growing up, I heard many a revival preacher use that word. But it's like this. Say you go on Microsoft Word and you got a document on your screen and you click that little box which makes the sentences line up on both sides. That's what God's grace does. It lines us up on both sides and it's not anything that we do in and of ourselves. There is nothing we have to do to earn God's grace. There is nothing we have to do to earn God's grace. There is nothing we have to do to earn God's grace. Absolutely nothing. All we have to do is accept it. And in that acceptance, we invite love in to help us remember that we are not mistakes, that we are created by God, that we are loved by God. Mr. Rogers put it this way in one of his books. He says, I believe that at the center of the universe there dwells a loving spirit who longs for all that's best in all of creation, a spirit who knows the great potential of each planet as well as each person, and little by little will love us into being more than we ever dreamed possible. That loving spirit would rather die than give up on any one of us. That's a gospel in the quote. But then there's this whole thing of perfectionism and imperfection. How is imperfection a gift if it is so burdensome in the way that it plays out in our culture as perfectionism is to constantly trying to get it right? How can imperfection be a gift. Well, the Apostle Paul, in the passage we heard from 2 Corinthians, used as the metaphor the image of clay jars, which in ancient times were rough vessels in which wine or other um, substances could be stored in, and they often cracked. It's that when God's love and God's presence gets poured into us, if we are the clay vessel, we invariably have cracks. 
But what shines through the cracks is God's light and God's love. Some of you, as United Methodists, perhaps cradle United Methodists, may be wondering, but what about this Christian perfection thing? Y'all heard of that? John Wesley said that as Christians, there was something called Christian perfection. Doesn't that seem to run counter to what we're talking about this morning? I want to tell you my peach story. Some of you have heard it before. And actually, tomatoes work well, too. They're in season right now. So let's say you want to do a taste test of peaches, right? So you go to the grocery store, and you pick out the roundest, most beautiful peach, right? And you purchase it. You go home and you take off the produce sticker and you wash it. And as my dad did, he taught me how to, how to cut peaches. He would take a paring knife and run it around the vertical, uh, not the equator, anyway, vertically around this way, twist it apart, pull out the pit, right? So you do that. And so you put it on a plate on your counter. You have a peach tree in your backyard. So you go to the backyard, and your peaches are in, and you pick a ripe peach, and as you pull it, you notice a worm's been at it. And if there's the worm still in it, you just pull the worm out, right? Come inside, and you wash it, and you cut around, take it apart, pull out the pit, and cut out the worm damage and you lay it on a plate. What is something you notice in the two peaches right away? Which one has a scent? The one, the one from the backyard, it has a scent. The one from the grocery store doesn't have much. And so you take a bite of the one from the grocery store and it crunches. Right? Who likes crunchy peaches? Doesn't have much flavor either. So then you pick up a half from the one in your backyard and you bite into it and you've got to run over to the sink because the juice is dripping down your chin. It's one of those eat it over the sink peaches, right? And oh, the taste is just wonderful. So what does this have to do with Christian perfection? The peach from the store looked like it was without flaw, right? It looked like the ideal. But the one from your backyard that was so juicy and which had flaws, that one is more like a peach, the way God created peaches to be. Christian perfection doesn't mean being without flaw. It means becoming mature into who God created us to be, being filled with love and letting that divine love work on us so that we can not only remember who we are, but we can live ever more faithfully into who God has created us to be in all of our wonder. The psalmist says, I praise you for I am wonderfully and fearfully made. When I was ordained, the bishop asked me, do you expect to be made perfect in this life? And I said, yes. But that consists of not taking on other tasks to try to make myself perfect what it means is that I allow God's love to enter in and keep working on me. We're going to make mistakes. We have flaws. 
but those aren't deal breakers for God. We accept the grace that's offered. We let it take up residence within us as well as God's love so that we can grow into being the neighbor that God calls us to be and so that we can offer the message, you are special and I like you just the way you are. Amen.